Hey there, and welcome to the channel. My name is Eric Hunley, and it's been a few months since we did this. Um, we did a series of body language videos on Amber Heard, which exhausted both my co-host here, Gavin, and myself, but, but we persevered. And lately, making the rounds, we have another individual who thinks a lot about himself, if not of himself, not really sure, we'll go ahead and try to find out, and that's Prince Harry. Now, of course, Gavin is a real royal expert and historian. He loves the royal family, being from England, and is going to provide all guidance. Oh, wait, no, never mind. I don't think he's really into the royal family, but he is English, so I get the bona fides there. And he's also an expert on body language and statement analysis. So how are you doing today, Gavin? I was getting concerned with where you were going with that intro, but uh, yeah, you got the, got the English bit right, and that's about it. And uh, <laughs> so, but uh, having lived both in America and England, I've got a little bit of an advantage, but I don't know massive amounts. I'm not a historian on the royal family like some people are, but I will be able to say what I see. All right, perfect. Now, <sighs> I was arguing with um, one of the... Uh, Mexa accounts earlier and they were saying oh no 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 he's yours now <laughs> and I was saying no I prefer to think that we gave you Megan Markle so that's where I stand on this Gavin is we gave you Megan and you have a couple who's just out on tour but they're all yours oh no 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 we get the receipt <laughs> 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 okay so to get into what we are covering again it's it's going to be multiple videos probably three two or three on this video alone this is the tom i think his name is tom bradby um from itv and this interview had a little bit of contention he he actually you know pushed back a little bit on harry and i think it's worthwhile going into it there was also a 60 minutes interview which i think we're going to skip because the behavior panel did it. They're brilliant. I don't really want to, you know, step in their territory. We're hoping to add things that are a little bit different here uh, for all of you to enjoy. And if you like this, please let us know and we'll continue and do the Stephen Colbert interview. Now, I have to have a lot of good feedback to do Stephen Colbert because, in my opinion, I'm not sure which of the two are more insufferable. And it's, it takes a lot for me to um, to uh, gag my way through that one. So, folks, I really need the feedback on it. But, Gavin, let's go ahead and look at the start of this interview. Mm -hmm. And we always like to get a baseline, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. In fact, before you even start, if you look at the, the, the posture that he's sitting in from, from the very beginning there, he's got his feet withdrawn kind of almost under. The, the chair, his hands between his legs, almost like a, a schoolboy type stance. It, it's almost like he's kind of um, how you would imagine a schoolboy to be sitting, you know, when, when they're in, in lesson. So, uh, so I just thought I'd point that out before we before we kick off. Yeah. He, uh, is this a boy in lesson or a boy in front of the principal or whatever you have over there? Headmaster or what have you? Because he does have kind of a, I don't know what, what's coming. What's coming? By any account. This as an extraordinary tale, and from your perspective, it's a holistic account of your life. And I'd say to anyone who's sitting down to watch this tonight, whatever you think, whatever's gone before, this book is takes things to a whole new level because it's a complete account for you, of your life. However, I think I do have to start with a simple question, which is, why? Why have you written it? All right, so baseline, what you said, um... A lot of just gulping. I, I don't know what's going on. Why, why the why the worries about this? So at, at this particular stage, I don't think he knows exactly where it's going to go and how it's all going to come across. This is his, his big moment in the spotlight, as it were. I mean, I know he spent most of his life in the spotlight, but this is his got to get it right telling my side of the story part. So you can see he's got his hands in, he's fidgeting with his, he's got his thumbs that he's, he's circling like this, or he's fidgeting with his fingers, and he's, I think even his wedding ring at one point. Um, I think he, he's unsure about where this is going to go. 
uh, where the questions are going to lead and, and what his answers are going to be. So he's, he's, got, he's got a little bit of apprehension. I wouldn't say nervous, but he's a little bit apprehensive as to where this could end up going. He's got a few stress signals going on. And we'll see what happens when he gets a little bit more comfortable and starts relaxing a little bit lower in your guard as, uh, as, as the interview goes on. Okay. And, and to be fair to him, this is a big interview. We're not implying any kind of deception or anything here because he's under a spotlight and anybody under the spotlight might act in a similar manner, especially to start. Is that fair? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I, people talk about baseline a lot. And, and you have to understand that a baseline adjusts. So a person's baseline when they're out in the bar drinking with their friends will be completely different to a per the same person's baseline when they're in a court of law or when they're in the office or when they're at home with their wife. So understanding baseline, you also have to understand that that baseline can fluctuate. At the moment, this is his baseline for the beginning of this interview. So it gives you an idea that, you know, where, where how he's feeling at this moment. 38 years, 38 years of having my story told by so many different people um, with an intentional spin and distortion. Felt like a good time to own my story and be able to tell it for myself. You know, I, I don't think that if I was still part of the institution that I would have been given this chance to. So I'm actually really grateful that I've had the opportunity to tell my story, because it's my story to tell. Now, pretty much everyone watching this will be from a family. Mm -hmm. And the idea that someone in the family is going to tell the world all the family arguments and secrets would be so how do you justify the level of disclosure that is in this book well there's been a which I, I suppose lots of people know now there was a motto a family motto of never complain never explain and what people have realized now through the netflix doc documentary and numerous stories coming out over the years is that that was just a motto okay so uh, he doesn't like that motto Oh, he certainly doesn't, not at all. In fact, you can see this double twitch of contempt. It's very rare you see, but you, you know, I think it happens twice in this entire interview. So you've not just got that one kind of one-sided contemptuous twitch of his mouth, but two in one in one shot, as it were, um, when, when he talks about that. Um, the, the, this motto, I think you will find, is something that has been a, a thing to shut conversation down over the years. Um, and and mm. when he says it's a family motto, I think he's so sick of hearing it. And he, he's gone to tell, you know, one of the royal members of the family, one well, maybe his dad, and, and, you know, his dad's turned around and said something like, eh, never complain, never explain. And he's gone, but daddy, eh, never complain, never explain. He's like, oh, you can see he hates this. This has been the thing that's been thrown at him so many times that he, he just can't stand the very thought of that motto. Um, there is something also to, interesting to, to pay attention to when he talks about earlier on um, the, the paparazzi and the, the press. He bites his cheek on the one side a couple of times, uh, which you will, will spot again later on. And then an interesting thing to pay attention to, and the reason you, you, we'll, we'll come uh, to the reason behind why, when he talks about the institution, he does this kind of waving with his left hand. So he, he and the inst he talks about either the institution or the family, and the, and there's a, and there seems to be a big different thing, like almost like a bifurcation of his life between the two sides of what the institution is and what his family is. And I think the two have clashed a lot. And I think it, sometimes they're, they're in their official role and sometimes they're in their family role. And I think it's been very, very difficult for him to sometimes tell the two apart. Um, but we'll, we'll, we'll go more into that a little bit later on. Okay. Okay. And that's a specific thing to, I think, England and their family. It's like completely unique to their family. Like you bow to the queen and then you say mummy. Yeah, <laughs> or, or whatever Charles does, it's like that is befuddling to a lot of people. But it continues now. Um, but for me, I sit here now speaking to you, answering the questions that you put to me, um, and the words and the truth will come from my lips rather than using other people, especially through the tabloid media. Um, and we're six years into it now, um, and I have spent every single year of those six doing everything I can privately to get through to my family. And the thing that is the saddest about this, Tom, is it never needed to be this way. It never needed to get to this point. I've 
had conversations. I've... I always did, 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 never mind the body language, but the whole it never needed to get to this point. <laughs> He's very concerned about privacy mm -hmm. as he is in a world premiere interview mm -hmm. with everybody tuning in. So that was also hmm. a very clever little bit of speech that he did there as well. And and one, what I've seen this kind of thing done before. It's really brilliant how when people use certain amount of things that you can't argue with and then add something to it. And what happens is you create this rolling of like kind of that's the truth, that's the truth, that's the truth. And this has been inserted at the end. So that must be a truth as well. Um, mm. So he says, so, so for me, you know, I'm sitting here now talking to you, answering the questions, and therefore everything in my book is the truth. Uh, or something along those lines. Um, and, and of course, so what it does, it plays on the logic of the mind. If I were to say to you, Eric, I'm sitting here now, can't be argued, I am, talking to you on, on this live stream, can't be argued, I am, and therefore I know I've written this book that I did a few weeks ago, and everything in it is true. And it kind of... It, it, it doesn't mean that that last one is, but because you're on that logical role of that's true, that's true, and that's true, therefore the last thing must be true as well. So people use that as, a, as an argumentative way of getting their point across. Which is clever. I, I would argue that's probably part of his training because you get people, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, you do hypnosis as well, right? Isn't this a compliance mechanism in his speech? That's it. It's, it's kind of the nodding dog effect once you've got somebody going, yep, 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 and agreeing. And, and of course, you've got the whole um, thing where, where people almost zone out a little bit when you're saying that bit of, for me, sitting here now, talking to you, it's kind of a soothing kind of, yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you get into that kind of almost like a trance state of, of zoning out and, and then when he gets to the point of saying what he's saying, it's just accepted. So, so yeah, very clever. And it pro probably is very much trained. Everything he's said so far um, has been very, very well calculated and well crafted and thought out. It, it's, it, he's, he's in his own mind rehearsed what he's going to say before any of it has come out. Written letters, I've written emails, and everything is just, no, you, this is not what's happening. You, you're, you're imagining it. And that's really, that's really hard to take. So I've got a little issue with that statement there. Um, he, he says, I've written emails, I've contacted, I've written letters, and everything has been, no, no, this isn't the way it is, you're just imagining it, or something along those lines. And he hasn't said by who. He hasn't mm. said directly, you know, well, you know, my father wrote back to me, or my father called me, or my brother emailed me and said, no, this isn't the way it is. He, he's just, he, he hasn't he even implied a body. He's just said, it's just been no, 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 you're imagining it. Or, you know, or whatever the word is. And so there was no there was no kind of attaching it to a, a particular person or body to say who or what he said. So it could be his own mind, it could be his wife telling him that, it could be any number of things, but but he hasn't... Could be us right yeah, now. Exactly. So he hasn't really put a, a kind of um, a, a direction on where that has come from. Um, so again, you know... It, it's open to speculation and it leaves it to the person uh, receiving the information to make their mind up who said no 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 you're imagining it so um all right yeah <laughs> all right so this next bit here is um i believe a little bit of statement analysis because he's not on screen which i want to point out in these interviews if they're trying to help him there's convenient cut points in editing like if he's asked a question and about to say something, coincidentally, it's another angle. And this went on very heavy in the docu-series on Meghan and Harry. Mm -hmm. That I saw a lot, which is very irritating. This one's better than some. So yeah. I'm just pointing out an editing trick that mm -hmm. I've noticed and others have. That thought flashing through my mind. And I remember waiting patiently for Pa to confirm that indeed Mummy was all right. And I remember him not doing that. There was then a shift internally. I began silently pleading with Pa, or God, or both. No, no, no. When I hear that and see that, now I'm going to be projecting here, mm -hmm. but throughout the whole interviews, all of these, 
has he matured beyond the point of that boy who lost his mother? And I don't mean this. I'm, I'm not trying to be rude. I, I'm, I feel terrible about the loss. But has he matured beyond that point? Because even the way he's saying that, I understand that he's flashing back to being a child and speaking in a childlike way, but it feels natural. It feels like that child may still be sitting there and all these years in between, maybe, maybe he's just never gotten through it. I don't know. What are your thoughts? I, I think, I, I think you're, you're spot on with it, Eric, to be honest with you. I mean, he's, he's in a position, a unique position where he hasn't really grown up because let's face it, he hasn't really had to. Unlike the rest of the working world who get to 18 or 21 or 16 or whatever age where they get told, right, you know, school's over now, go and get a job, pay for yourself. If you don't work, you don't eat, you know, and get out there. He, he doesn't have to do that. He's a royal. So, yes, he's got responsibilities, but at the same time, you know, we've seen him over the years kick back. He's departed. He's gone wild. He's, he's confessed himself to taking cocaine in his book and, and, and other drugs and other different things. He, he's, he's, done, he's had his wild days. We know we're aware of this. And let's face it, if this was if this was from another angle, if this was Princess Harriet, we'd be screaming daddy issues. We'd be having a whole mm. different conversation. Um, so, you know, it, 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 if you look at the things that he's done, um, you know, take, take his mom out of the picture for the moment. But if you look at the things that he's done, if this was from a princess that was doing this, we would be, we would be having a completely different uh, angle and a different take on this. We'd be saying, hang on, you know, she's sleeping with this uh, guy to get back at daddy. She's partying to get back at daddy. She's dressing in a particular way to get back at daddy. Everything is, is you know, kind of daddy issues if it was a girl. So just because he's a male doesn't mean to say that those daddy issues aren't still there, especially with no mummy around to, um, if you look at the, like I say, with, with the, psycholo the psychological point of view um, of, of siblings, and I know there are different variations, but if we just go off two siblings, an older and a younger, um, the younger one is usually the one who's the, the, the baby, who's the mummy's boy, who gets, well, and, uh, this is a, a generalized statement, but you know, this is something that is usually the case, not for everybody. So before I get hung, drawn and quartered, um, but it's usually the, the younger sibling, that's the baby that is spoiled. So um, with, with the younger one being the mummy boy and not having a mummy to be there, it's obvious that, you know, the next nearest target is daddy. By the way, uh, on that note, um, you said something significant. I think it's even more in this case when you said he's a royal and doesn't have to. I don't think that's quite true because I think his brother is saddled with the responsibility mm -hmm. and does have a very major job. Yeah. And perhaps, you know, the title of the book is Spare. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of this is, uh, um, if not envy, it's a comparison between him and his brother. There's, there's a lot going on here. Oh. And as the quote Spare, mm -hmm. he even more so could be the mama's boy, or, you know, the baby or whatever you want to put it. And then you compound the royal aspect. So you have two things. You have one, you don't, you're not the primary person. You're just there in case something bad happens. And then two, though, you're still a royal. So we're going to enable you in every way possible and kiss your ass. <laughs> Yeah, and and of course this whole this whole sibling rivalry of what what you mentioned about the the older brother being I mean in in, in most uh, two sibling cases where the older one is usually uh, in normal everyday life usually the more responsible and mature one anyway um, you've got this thing where up until the age of twelve I believe it was when he, when his mom died he would have been the baby he would have been spoiled by his mom um, and of course when she was taken out of the picture. In my opinion, and this is purely, you know, based on just from what I've, what I've seen, I reckon Granny took the place of Mommy. Um, yeah, sure. I reckon the Queen was like a surrogate mom to him for many reasons, and that was why he's probably been given a, a, a little bit of kind of um, loose rein to, to do pretty much what he wants. But imagine from his point of view where you are the baby, you are the spoiled one, you are the one who gets your own way with absolutely everything. So you get used to this kind of sense of entitlement, but then at the same time being told, but well, you're never going to be king. Not before me, right. big bro. 
you know. Um, and I've got, I mean, I've got a younger brother, and if I was in the same situation, I would be a nightmare. I, I would have the Disney song on my ringtone. I just can't wait to be king. Um, I would, I mean, I'd be going to Burger King. I'd be doing all sorts of things to wind him up, you know. And and if I'm going to do that, then there's no reason why he wouldn't do that as well, uh, you know, because you can see that kind of relationship between them. So you know, it's it, 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 the the will be that sibling rivalry. So you can imagine how torn he must be, kind of you know being the one, and he's even said it in his book, Air and Spare. You know, he says, I'm right, right, right. brought up being the baby, given all the love, and, and yet here I am told I'm just a spare part. Um, funny enough, I've actually got my brother saved in my phone as spare parts. Um, so, <laughs> <laughs> so there you go. Uh, all right, so, so bottom line, Gavin yeah. would be insufferable. Oh, I'd be a nightmare. Um, so I, I can see that the two princes being exactly the same. I went, I took myself back to that moment and tried to remember as much as possible. You know, my father coming in in his dressing gown and sharing that news with me. Only now, as part of writing the book, did I really think about how many hours he'd been away. And the compassion that I have for him as a parent, having to sit with that for many, many hours, trying to work out how the hell do I break this to my two sons? And I never want to be in that position. Part of the reason why we're here now. I never, ever want to be in that position. I don't want history to repeat itself. I do not want to be a single dad. And I did, certainly don't want my children to have a life without a mother or a father. Wow. All right, we got a little bit of a yeah. sniff in there. <laughs> um, interesting. I wonder if this is might be a crack like if this is a sign maybe for later that he could be coming to the realization that things are going wrong here uh, um like you said writing the book made him think about his father and in fairness whatever anybody thinks about that that is a nightmare to have to tell your children and oh. i do appreciate that he at least um had the generosity to you know say yeah. that yeah, I mean, it, it is great that he's acknowledged it, which is brilliant, because I think up until writing that book, he's probably never looked outside his own point of view. Um, you can see that the contempt is still there when he talks about his dad coming in in a dressing gown. You can see that cheap bite again uh, that he does when he says his dad sits down on the bed. Um, then he, he talks a, a, about it again, and, and you can see that where he says, I never want to be a single dad. Um, I mean, he does that, that kind of thing. And and I don't think that's him referring to himself as how he would be as a single dad. I think that's how he sees the, the single dad in his life and how you know, he, he's reflecting upon his, his kind of, um, how, he, how he perceives a single dad or how his dad was. During his dad. Yeah, is that contempt or disgust? That one's so close, it's hard for me to... Yeah, I think there's a little bit of both in there. Um, I think it, so. You've got the the contempt with the smile, but I think also when you've got that going on, that, that you know, that kind of it, it's like an outward sniff. Yeah. Um, I think that's almost. Um, Mark Bowden does a good job of it when he talks about his little dog who goes when he when he's annoyed because you haven't taken him for a walk. So, <laughs> um, so yeah, you, you've you've got that side of it in there uh, with the contempt and the disgust all, all in one. Um, and, and like I say, I don't think until reading that book that he's ever even thought about it outside of his own point of view. But, so you know. it's a main course of contempt with a dessert of disgust. Oh yeah, gotcha. <laughs> Nature of it, and at one point it's discussed that maybe William should walk behind the the coffin alone and you say no Willie, as you call him if the situation is the reverse he would never let me do it alone and that's mm. why you decide to do it but it's a boy that's some um, oh. uh, it's like he's <laughs> i mean it's like william and uh, uh, it's like he's gearing up to fight yeah so you can you can see i'm going to turn sideways here you can see he's kind of slouched forward a little bit and the minute that's mentioned he's kind of he, he gets his back up and you know you've probably heard the same we say it over here you probably say it over there as well you know he really got my back up um this is something that the minute that this is mentioned he's back he's up his shoulders are back it's almost like he's like you say he's gone to this fighting posture um there's a lot of, of high stress signals that are going on there with his posture change um uh, all, all to do with kind of this discussion which I don't think he was entirely, I think he may have been part of, but didn't have as much control of as he would have liked about him walking behind uh, his mom's uh, coffin at the point of the funeral. 
whereas our mother was taken away far too young. Another thing that seems to have stayed with you and I think will stay with anyone who reads the book is you get to the moment where you demand of Jamie, your private secretary, that you want to see the secret government file and your description of that is searing. Yeah, that bit there, you can see that uh, cheek bite again when he's talking about his secretary, Jamie. Um, I think there's a lot of stress to do with, I, I think he's asked several times for that file and has been denied. I think there's been a lot going on. I think there's been a lot of foot stamping been happening before he finally got to see it. And I think that's why there's several signs of contempt for, for uh, not just Jamie's secretary, but uh, you know other, other people as well with regards to that. A lot of grief in there too, though. Oh, yeah, a lot of regret in there so i'm not sure so you think he has seen it or has not it's yeah. not completely clear so he's see, he's seen parts of it he hasn't seen the full file um it, it's it, it, he's seen a like kind of redacted version as it were with some of the more graphic sure. taken out. so which um i don't know whether he was entirely happy with that or whether it was just the fact that it was taking so long and, and he's had to do so much and push so hard just to get to see what he has seen. But again, is this a shifting? Because I, I see uh, that regret coming in there it, where there's this, I don't know, it's, it's such a weird thing, like, like he's reliving all the disgust of pushing at the secretary, mm -hmm. but also coming to the realization and maybe as a father or whatever that, would you want your kids to see something so horrific? Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I think there's a lot of things at play here, and like you say, he's very. Um, I mean, you know, physically, he he's what 38, 39 years old, something like that. Thirty eight. Yeah, yeah, 38 years old. So, but I think emotionally, he's probably still very much in the emotional state of a teenager, and I think he's going through that state of realizing that there are other perspectives to the world and not just his you know and i think now that he's got children of his own that he that he's starting to look at things especially with writing the book like you say he's looking at things from other people's angles and, and saying yeah you know, ah, and now i get you know what i like you said would i want my kids to see these photos of her mom if this happened to her you know how would i tell my kids this has happened to their mother so i think there's a lot of i think it's opened up a lot of things to him in his mind and, and has really kind of um kind of sent his world into a bit of a spiral Everybody's gonna get annoyed with me. They're like, "What are you, a big Harry fan?" It's like, no, I'm trying to. Get, I, I I guess I'm trying to. I'm trying to hope that anyone can grow, and I, I don't have as much hope for Amber. I have a, a little hope. I see little cracks with Harry. Like, like there may be a message getting in there, but there's so much cognitive dissonance going on. Um, and so much influence on him from someone else that it's very difficult to come out. But given some time, maybe. I'd heard people talking about there being photographs. By this point, I was starting to understand the involvement of the paparazzi chasing her. And to this day, I will remain eternally grateful for Jamie for showing me what he believed I needed to see but removing the stuff that he knew I didn't need to see. Um, I don't know where I'd be now if I saw the stuff that I wanted to see, that I demanded to see. So we've got a couple of things there. Um, one is when he says, I was grateful, if you notice, his eyes are closed during that point. So, you know, he didn't mm, get blocking. I was grateful for what I saw. Um, there's a lot of lot of signs um, from the beginning here. He's biting the cheek again. He's doing lots of little things about... Uh, when but, but, but it's a grateful... Okay, hold on. Is this uh, grateful eye blocking as in... Um, not wanting to acknowledge that I wasn't really grateful, or is it eye blocking that I was grateful, but I'm also eye blocking because the horrific signs caused me to block? I, I'm not sure. If I had to go with anything, I think there has been a big, big argument and, and a long lasting argument before he got to see this file. And I think he's been he's been probably locking horns with his secretary Jamie and other people as well for a long, long time. So when he says he's grateful, I think he's grateful that it eventually happened. But I think he, there's a lot of I don't know, 
I, I don't even know what the right word is to describe it, but a lot of tension. Uh, maybe that that has built up before he finally got to see this file, and I think that's the bit that's probably getting to him. The, the fact that he's had to really fight to be able to see these pictures. I'm going to put in a possibility that I think it could also be a monkey's paw situation. Of careful of what you wish for, you might just get it. Mm. Yeah. So I I don't know for sure, but that one I'm honestly I. I, I don't feel confident on I know that obviously there's a blocking obviously there's a discomfort obviously there's something he's against but I I can't help but wonder because I mean that is his entire focus in life is the death of his mom which is horrible obviously but that is I mean that's a recurring thing and not even more than a prince it's like life started mom died we haven't gone on beyond it it's well weird. it has been a recurring nightmare and of course you've got to look at the fact from from the the point of view of, of a 12 year old boy that's lost his mom it's going to be the conversation with diana was very very loved the world over by many um so of course when you, you know everywhere he goes he's going to kind of be in her shadow uh, and and the conversation is going to be brought up i'm really sorry about what happened to your mom there's going to be people there's going to be conspiracy theorists about how it happened there's going to be uh people who, who can tell you where they were when it happened so he's, he's never going to be able to get out of that loop of reliving you know right in, in in that incident so i think that's really going to kind of haunt him for a long long time and you know well, obviously, I've wanted for a long, long time, but I mean, you know, he, he's going to find it hard to escape from that, from that loop, and, and moving on from that twelve-year-old boy that that was given the news of his mom dying. And would you think there's you a going... lot of things that are unexplained? Um, but I've been asked before whether I want to open up, a, you know, another inquiry. I don't really see the point at this stage. Um, but I think anyone who knows, again, this is the most amazing thing that after, over the last what five years, especially. Okay. And I think you were pointing out um, on that one, and it's perfect timing for this because that is going to be the last clip of this video. Mm. And we just see a methodology where Harry very deftly changed the subject. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So you can see him distinctly talking about whether he wants to reopen the whole investigation, whether he wants to go through it again. And you see his focus change, you see him look up and left, you see him think and calculate and say, where is this going? And he decides to completely redirect the conversation and, and change it and alter it uh, entirely. Um, I think that, yeah, the, 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 remember for the next one, Remember the hand that he used when he was talking about the institution. Part of the institution that I would have been given this chance to. Because we're going to come back to that in, in one of the next videos. Um, and, and you'll see the relevance of it. So, uh, But yeah, awesome. that was a really, really good one so far. There's lots more to come. Lots more to come. And as a little bit of a teaser, if you want us to continue the series, please comment below. And one of the things we will definitely definitely be covering is this little video right here this little section a couple of things you talk about accountability mm. in the oprah interview you accuse members of your family of racism you don't even no, we well of the british press said that right i did did megan ever mention that they're, they're racist she said there were troubling comments about yeah, oh, there, there was skin concern color. about his skin color right wouldn't you describe that as essentially racist? I wouldn't, not having lived within that family. Right. <laughs> so if you want to check this out, and we will be going into that clip because that has some nice juiciness going on in an upcoming section. Um, I mean, there's all kinds of things going on there. Plus, we get some statement analysis that we can apply to it as well, since we're talking about describing events and i think you'll have a good time with it so please comment below if you want to hear more and in the meantime check out gavin stone you can find him on youtube there's a link in the description and be sure to subscribe so you can see what's happening next now thank you so much gavin